Uh, yeah, I just felt such a strong presence of the Lord. It was kind of welling up, and Diana, I really bore witness to what you said. Felt the same thing of the Lord just coming in our midst, and um, I felt like He was just saying that He really knows everything, every single thing that every single one of you has gone through. He has been there, and He has allowed certain things to bring us very jealously to this place where He can begin to literally transform us. And I feel like we're, we are in a sovereign season of transformation from death to self in His resurrection life in a way that we've never experienced it. We've only dreamed of it. You know, like it says in Psalm 126, when the Lord turned away our captivity, we are like them that dreamed and that we would come again, you know, with those seeds you know, and bringing forth the tears and bringing the joy that he's bringing to us. And he just wants to encourage us because I think it's been a very, very long season for most of us. Very painful. We went through things that we didn't think it'd have to be so hard and so long. But beloved, he wants you to know that he really knows. He sees you. He has always seen you. And it's been a testing. I know I have. And I'm sure I can speak on behalf of all of you because I know most of you. He really, really is coming, as the Lord said through Diana, to reveal his love, which is better than we ever thought. It's bigger than we thought. He's, he formed us in our mother's womb specifically for this hour, beloved. And it's something that has never been seen on the earth. And he's coming, you know, he's brought us low so that we will know it's him. He will get all the glory, but he really has come to show his heart and to show himself off. So, Father, encourage your children today that you see them, you know them, and you're coming to exalt yourself uniquely through them as a unique vessel. So we just welcome you, Holy Spirit, in a new and living way to come and revive our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, as Pastor Rick has said before, this is a time of answered prayer and a time when God is forming himself in us using all things. So we're grateful always for the work of transformation. Well, I was saying many of you have known Marnie over the years as an elder in this church for the last 10 years, which is amazing to think. And I believe about four years ago, she was ordained, uh, uh, ordained as one of the pastors. And so she's been serving in a very faithful manner for those years. So what some of you may not know is that she has come to this church uh, all those years ago as an elder uh, and as a co-leader for the women's ministry, but as an elder with the Malibu Vineyard. And of course, she brings a lot of her experience volunteering in all kinds of settings, schools, as well as organizations in the community and churches. And what some of you may not know, that she um, has an interesting background as the founder and the former teaching director of Community Bible Study in Malibu, which is a tremendous outreach to the community in teaching the Word of God. And she's also perhaps very fittingly been the director of Partners for Transformation, which is a nonprofit organization over many years. And she has spoken at churches and women's retreats in the U.S. and conferences amongst many nations. So we're just grateful that God has given her a word today for this congregation. And so I just encourage you to just welcome her and really welcome uh, the anointing of God in her to deliver that word. Amen. Wow, I forgot all that stuff. <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to be using this. Is this working? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Lord, thank you for opportunity to, to, to uh, share what you've given me and put on my heart for your people. And we just open ourselves up for your Holy Spirit to say and do whatever you want today. We ask that you would... Um, release deeper truth and this resurrection life that's been so spoken of this morning into our hearts today. We look to you for that, 
We have great hope, Lord, in Jesus' name. And my message today is about hope and courage. And uh, I was thinking a lot about them. There's a couple of words that we really don't talk about a lot. We talk about faith, we talk about love, but, but hope and courage, I think, are what the Lord is wanting us to be more um, aware of and maybe more intentional about thinking about how is hope and courage being expressed in my life. And so they're essential. And, and as I speak, I hope that each of you will purpose to kind of begin, even now, to stir up hope in your heart for things that maybe died, for things that you've never had, for things that you want to change. Just stir up hope and choose, and we'll get into this, because courage is a choice. Choose to have courage, to, to walk out whatever it's going to take to get you from where you are into the place that God wants you to be. It's, it's a choice that we make to partner with Him and that He would give us fresh expectation and confidence that He's going to do that. So, you know, courage is something we think of related to danger, you know, or risk, being brave, being bold to do things, but it's more um, than being brave in the face of danger. It's doing uh, what we're called to do or what's put in front of us with determination, with strength in our hearts. Cur when we say encourage, it means with heart. So God wants us to do what he's called us to do with his strength in our hearts. That's doing it with courage. So it's not just boldness in the face of a difficulty, but it takes courage every morning to get up and do a hard job or a boring job, but that's where you've been placed. It takes courage to do that. It takes courage to wait patiently while we wait for the outworking of circumstances that are really beyond our control. It takes courage to make a commitment to change, to do whatever it is that God's nudging you towards by the Spirit. It takes courage to choose hope when you're in a dark time. So to act with courage, we need to be motivated, right? We, it's hard to choose, choose courage unless we're motivated, and God's catalyst to courage is hope. So that's why I put those two words together. If we have hope, we'll be able to choose courage. If we can see something that in our future that we believe God is uh, making available to us, that gives us hope, and then we can choose courage. He wants us to live in hope. We all know Romans 15, 13, um, where God says he actually wants us to abound in hope. Now may the God of hope, that means he's the source, the author of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. That's something God has to give us. He's the author of it. So hope would be defined as confident expectation of good, something good, right? Um, biblical hope is not only wanting the thing, but it's being confident that we have it. We may not have gotten it yet, but we have absolute confidence be, that God has made it available to us and it can be ours. So our hope is not in a thing, it's in God. Our hope is not in an outcome that we want, it's in God. And we have to make sure that that's where our hope is focused. We, we sometimes think, oh, well, if I had a better job, then I could be this person. No, God is the source of change in us. God is the person who's going to make the difference that we hope for. And so it has to be in Him. If we're hoping for our outcome, there's really no reason for us to be confident that we're going to get it because God doesn't promise to give us everything we want. We all know that. So He does make amazing promises of what He'll do for us as we hope for His purposes, as we hope for what he has envisioned for our lives. And so um, when we learn to hope in him for the outcome that he wants, doors to his creative activity in our lives will be opened up. But the hope needs to be in him. You know, um, hope is confident expectation of good. And the word expectation is important because a lot of us have unconscious expectations. We have things that we aren't even aware of that are coloring how we see our future or how we see God or how we see our circumstances. And a lot of them are negative expectations, aren't they? Because of the experiences that we've had in life. They often, the things that we've experienced in the past, we've been discouraged or disappointed because something didn't happen 
that hasn't changed in our lives, and, it, and those things give us a negative um, and false beliefs about who God is and what he wants for our future. And so um, we end up being afraid of having hope because we're gonna be disappointed again. Have you ever felt like that? I know I have frequently. I'm afraid to hope for that because what if it doesn't happen? And so today I just really wanna talk about aligning ourselves with the hopes that God has for us, the, the plans that he has lined up for us, the things that he's already made available that we haven't yet seen and walked into. So um, we're, we're praying, I'm praying that we will you know, have those unconscious negative expectations and fears and false beliefs really dealt with and broken off that he'll reveal to each one of us where it is that he wants to operate um, in a new way today. So, you know, we're, he, he wants to get us out of uh, negative expectations and into positive ones. And he gives us a lot of promises in his word to shift us out of that negative thinking and into the positive ones, but we have to choose um, to believe him. If we're not believing him, he can't release to us the good that he wants to. So hope is positive expectation, courage is bold determination, and God wants us to put them together, that we'd have the vision for this and the strength to walk into it, okay? So they're partners. So um, looking at Romans uh, 15, 13 again, it says that he, God, the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Believing what? It's, it doesn't say in the verse, but I believe he's talking about believing that he is who he says he is. Believing that he will do what he said he will do. Uh, we'll have hope to the degree that we believe God and therefore trust him. You know, if we, you know, if we don't trust him, we can't possibly have hope. You know, a person who's really trusting in God, you will see the evidence of that in their lives. Um, when, when, we ha when we have hope, um, and when we trust him, hope will be able to abound in our lives. So what's the thing that God is working on? He gives us promises to show us his heart so that we'll trust him with our future. We'll trust him with our present. So we need both hope and courage. We need to both have an expectation of go good and then walk that out steadfastly with the strength that he gives us. Hope is evidence that we're trusting him. And genuine trust will produce hopefulness in our lives. So if we are sitting here thinking, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that situation. I don't really have hope for that. That's a sign, like a little red flag. You're not trusting God for that situation. And he does have a plan for that. I mean, uh, what Lisa got up and said, he knows everything that we've been through, everything we're going through. He knows exactly what we need, and he knows how to give us hope in the midst of difficult things. So, you know, I'm trying to stir up hope that there is change and that you can uh, have trust and expectation in areas that maybe you haven't had for a while. You know, it's like Abraham. Remember in Romans 4, he talks about he, he hoped against hope. Everything in his life said, this is hopeless. You will not get what God said you will have. But he trusted God. He believed that God said something and that he would do what he said, and therefore he had hope. Hope is an amazing thing. It's, a, it's just a buoyancy to life that we all really need. So basic and foundational to having hope in our lives is knowing who God is. If we have hope and courage, you know, it, it's because it flows from knowing God, from trusting that, um, trusting in his character and cultivating a sense of awe about who he is. Really taking time to think about his greatness and, and uh, faithfulness, all those characteristics that he's, he's shown us. Um, we have to have enough time in the word, enough time in worship that like this morning that presence of the Lord comes and we have this settled sense of his caring, his um, nearness to us, his willingness to intervene in our lives. It doesn't just happen here. It's going to happen as we're driving to work. It's going to happen when we're dealing with that difficult boss. The, the Lord wants us to have this settled confidence in his perfect love, in his perfect goodness, perfect wisdom, perfect power. I mean, we have to take time to think about who God is in order to have that settled confidence and hope where our minds will immediately go. When the enemy tries to come in with doubts about the nature of God, we will have a reservoir of what he said about himself 
that we've studied and thought about and really meditated on and praised and thanked him for. We, you know, when we have this unshakable trust in him that he's truly good, that his plans are always the best for us, that he's always seeking our ultimate good, those are the things that we need in order to have hope. So, you know, when we have lack and loss and pain and difficult circumstances, you know, we think, well, if God's so good, how come I'm not seeing very much of it in my life? You know, do we, do you ever feel that way? What happened over here? Did he forget about this particular area of my life? Um, so as believers, those who are believing and wanting to be filled with joy and peace, we have to stop right there. As soon as we find ourselves with those negative thoughts and um, quickly recognize what's happening and remind ourselves of the truth that we've been soaking in about who God is. Uh, you know, why is he doing this? Well, I don't know, but I remember that all the riches of wisdom and knowledge are in him. And so I can know that in his infinite wisdom, he's bringing me good in the very best way possible. May not seem like the best way to me, but I can remind myself he knows what's best and he knows how to do it. So, you know, something seems too big, too impossible. I remember, oh yeah, I, he is a sovereign God. Nobody can tell him not to do what he's planning to do. No one can stop him from doing what he's planning to do. He is an all-powerful, sovereign God. So I know that he can do everything that's necessary to bring the good to me that he wants to bring. Of course, I'm going to have to cooperate with that a little bit. That's why we're talking about hope and courage. There's a passage in Jeremiah 32 where God makes declarations about his commitment to us. And I'm not going to read the whole passage, but there are three, in three verses he says these three things. Now, you, these are promises to you, okay? I will not turn away from doing you good. I will rejoice over you to do you good. I will bring on you all the good that I have promised you. I'm going to read it again because I really want you to think about this. He's making a, pro a covenant promise, he says in the beginning of that, a covenant promise of what his heart is, of what he's committed to, is what he longs to do for each one of us, for you and for me. I will not turn away from doing you good. I will rejoice over you to do you good. I will bring on you all the good that I have promised you. Is that awesome? You should go look at Jeremiah 32 when you get home. This is a promise that's in effect forever. At all times, all circumstances, in today's problems with finances, with health, with marriages, with children, whatever it is, it is his joy to do us good in our time of need. So it's up to us to stir up hope in who God is. Grasp hold of who he really is and we'll stir up hope. When we face troubles, we don't sit around passively feeling sorry for ourselves. Remember Rick was talking about self-pity, how it was a dead end. He had himself sitting at the bench at the end of the cul-de-sac going, oh, poor me. You know, we don't do that. We instead stir up hope by remembering who God is, reminding ourselves that there's no one like our God, and he is for us. He is for us. It, I was thinking about 2 Chronicles 20, where there was a king of Judah who had to stir up hope because he had... Uh, all of the neighboring countries had amassed their armies to come and attack Israel together. Sort of sounds like present day, doesn't it? And uh, this is what he did to stir up hope. If you could have put up Second Chronicles 6. Um, this is the king. He's praying. He says, Oh, Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hands, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? See, that's, he's remembering the character of God here, isn't he? Are you not our God? He's claiming a personal relationship who drove out the inhabitants of this land before you, your people Israel, and gave it to the descendants of your son Abraham forever. And so... Um, He's saying, are you not our God, this sovereign, mighty ruler of the nations? You are our God. You care about this nation. We belong to you. And then in verse 12, um, this is what he, how he appeals. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us. No, and we don't even know what to do. But this is where we always have to end up. 
Our eyes are on you. That's hope. Our eyes are on you. All this is true. Hope doesn't mean we deny the facts, but our eyes on the God who rules the nations and who is our God. I mean, it's, it's exciting to see. This is, this, it's a pattern for us. So there's a declaration of hope that he believes there's a good God who cares about them personally and is willing to intervene. He doesn't know how God's going to answer. He just chooses to trust. That's when peace and joy fill your heart. You see, the God of hope, when you believe in who he is, will fill your heart with peace and joy, right? Uh, the verse we started out with, and so you, I'm sure you know what happened next, how this turned out. Verse 17, God sent a prophet to the king and gave him courage. He said, you will not need to fight this battle. <laughs> position yourself. See, that's what hope is, isn't it? It's positioning yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of who? Of the Lord. Who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem? Do not fear or do be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. The basis of hope is the promise that God is with us. Boy, this has got to be so embedded in us. He's for us and he's with us. All times, all circumstances, he is with us. You know, we can have this same courageous expectation to go out and know that God's fighting our battles um, and that something good is coming even when we face overwhelming circumstances. We may not know how he's going to deal with those circumstances, but we have the same prophet promise that he had. Um, he is with us always. We all know that verse in Hebrews 13, 5, maybe you can put that up, where the writer's talking, giving the people encouragement about being loving and, you know, hospitable and faithful in marriage and cultivating contentment and then to motivate them he adds this um, reminder of what God has promised and I love the amplified that's why we have it up here uh, can you go to verse oh, a little further on let's just start halfway through the verse um, for he God himself has said I will not in any way fail you or give you up or leave you without support I will not I will not I will not in any degree leave you helpless or forsake you or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. Now, is that awesome? I mean, we should all have that memorized, right? That is incredible. In the Greek, it's an emphatic triple negative. He is saying, uh-uh, no way, buddy. You, you can count on this forever. I am with you and I'm holding you. I'm supporting you. I am your support and your strength. And, and so this is to encourage us, to put courage in our hearts when he says, I am with you. That's why the king could go out and face the enemy. He had been encouraged by a promise of, I am with you. So courage isn't denying or pretending there's nothing wrong. It's a chosen attitude because we believe that our God is with us. We will not be ruled by fear. That we have, the reason we don't ever have to be afraid is because of this promise. I am with you always, forever, unfailingly, wherever you are. He's with us in every circumstance, whether it's discouragement, difficult people, um, temptations, demonic strategies. It doesn't matter what it is. He's still with us. He hasn't left us, and he hasn't left us without support. And we have to choose to believe this and let hope rise up for whatever we're struggling with. Promises like this are meant to secure our hearts in hope, to hold them there, removing doubt and fear. So for our hearts to be strengthened, to have hope and courage, we have to take hold of the promise, and we, we have to take hold of it personally. It's for me, not just for those guys, but for me. So when we read, um, when we read that verse, we say, he will never not ever stop sustaining me. No way will he ever abandon me. He is always present with me. And it's, it's good to speak those things out loud, to take the promises and rehearse them and declare them over yourselves. We need to hear what God says with faith, and we need to hear it as a, a personal um, promise to us. Do you remember... Um, <laughs> You remember in Hebrews 4, it says, and I don't think I gave this to Toby, but um, that Israel heard God's promise. Remember, God had promised he would give them the land. And the verse says, but the word which they heard did not profit them. 
It didn't do them any good to hear God's promise. Why? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard. See, it's not enough to sit in church or even to read your Bible if you're not hearing with faith and not applying it to yourself. It's a personal promise to you. Take that for yourself. And when we hear with faith, we start to get a vision of what God wants us to hope for. He, he's telling us through his promises what he wants us to hope for. Hope for an awareness of the reality of his presence operating in our lives. That's a big one. So um, when we hear with faith, we get this vision and we have a God-generated vision, we will have hope for it. Um, when Israel was about to cross over the river, Jordan, to get into the promised land, remember God came to, jo uh, to Joshua right there in that first chapter of Joshua, and, and he gave him a promise and a command. Let's look at that. Uh, so this is in the middle of God talking to him, no man shall be able to stand before you. Hmm, that's quite a promise. How do you like that one? No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, and we know how awesome that was, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Hmm, I think we've heard that before. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Now that second verse right there, the Lord is saying, this is what I want for you. I want you to divide the land. That's sort of like ho-hum to us. But you know what it sounded like to him? <gasps> I'm going to be get to be part of the people receiving the promise of God, of getting what God has said for 400 years belongs to our people. I get to go over there and get that land and divide it up and give it to God's people. See, this was, this was an awesome encouragement to him. This was hope to him to hear what God wanted him to do. The, the implication is it, it's going to be successful because you're going to divide it up and give it to the people. While he's standing there on the other side of the Jordan, he knows the giants are in the land. But God says you're going to divide it up. This was an incredible word of hope and encouragement to him. And then he had that promise that we read in verse 5, I will be with you. You, don't ha you can have courage because you have the promise um, that God is, is, is with you. In verse uh, 9, he says it again. Um, I don't know if you have yet. Have I not commanded you? <clears throat> be strong <clears throat> and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God knew it was not going to be easy. I mean, he's giving him a lot of encouragement here. He's, he's saying, don't be afraid. Just remember the promise. I'm doing it with you. You're not going in there alone, and you're going to divide the land. See, we have to have hope of what God's giving us and the encouragement of his promise to be with us in the midst of it. So after 40 years in the desert, Joshua got this vision. He was given hope and courage. And his words did strategically position Joshua to lead the people into what God already gave them, what God wanted to give them. The timing was now. And we need to do the same thing. Let God strategically position our hearts to be able to step into a new possibility or to imagine a different future than what it looks like right now. I don't know what your future looks like, but some of it may not look real great. But start to imagine with hope and courage that God wants to walk you into something new, something different. Um, and take hold of that hope. Hope is seeing what is not yet, right? It's having a vision of something good beyond the present circumstances. Hope will overcome doubt. It will overcome self-centered living. It will give you a vision of how to partner with God. And hope will empower you to pursue it with courage. You know, I spent a lot of time in the last couple of months in the book of Ruth, and I was thinking about how Naomi, you remember Naomi? Living in Moab, the family had gone there as economic migrants because there was famine in Israel. And after 10 years, her husband was dead, her sons were dead, and uh, she was in poverty. She was destitute. Um, but then one day, and I kind of picture her in the marketplace, you know, wishing she had enough money to buy something to eat, and she overhears a conversation. And somebody says, you know, God has visited Israel and is giving them bread. In other words, the famine is over and they have food to eat. God has provided for his people. Now, I want to ask you, when you hear about God doing something good for somebody else, what's your first reaction? Lots of times we think, oh, why are they getting that? Not me. 
or it's always like that, you know, I, God gives it to them, but not, not, not so much here, right? I mean, do you ever feel that way or am I just talking about myself? <laughs> or does it stir up hope? When you hear God has visited her, do you say, oh, maybe he'll visit me? God has provided for him, oh, maybe he has provision for me. That's what it's meant to do when you hear of a good thing God's doing, let it stir up hope in you that it's for you too. Um, when Naomi heard that, it caused her to change her mind about her circumstances. She wasn't stuck there. She didn't have a, a hopeless situation in, in her poverty. She suddenly could see a different perspective on her future. She heard with faith. She said, hey, this applies to me. I really belong back there where God is moving with his people. And so she was motivated to act. She got up and set out with hope of experiencing God's provision for herself. And, you know, you can't hope for what you don't see. She had a vision. Those words caused her to see God is giving people bread in Israel. Ah, I got to go back there. And so um, if we are lacking hope in any area, we need to ask God to give us eyes to see what he wants to generate hope for in our hearts. He's the one who will fill our hearts and cause us to abound with hope. So... Um, that kind of hope is the only thing that's going to motivate us to change, right? We need something to help us make changes. She had to get up and go back to her old hometown, and I thought, how would that feel to go back as a destitute, poverty-stricken widow? Was there shame that how much she had lost when they'd gone off to Moab? Was there fear of not being accepted? Oh, well, you left, you know, being an outcast. I mean, who knows what she... but. But she went back. She took courage to get her back to the place where God was visiting his people. That's where we want to locate ourselves, isn't it? Where God's visiting his people. And, you know, it, it's hope that triggers the courage to go back and do whatever hard things. The, the same thing in the story of Esther. Mordecai gave her vision of something that she could hope for when there was a death decree hanging over her. And that hope gave her the courage to go into the court and petition the king. So you see how they are working together. Both of them needed vision to go into action. And because of the hope that they had, the vision they had, they were willing to take great risks and um, do something difficult. So that's, you know, I was thinking that's why testimonies are so great for us, you know, so helpful. If we, if we hear them for faith, with faith, and we apply them to our, ourselves, um, they help us see that there might be hope in that area, another way to respond to something, like have a new perspective, um, stir up a, a, a new attitude uh, 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 that God has something other available for me than I can yet see. You know, that's what we do when we share our testimonies with each other. I don't mean up here with the microphone, I mean among ourselves. We need to do that. It's stir up hope among each other by sharing what God's doing in our lives. So you take hold of the promises of God as real and, you, and believable and you make them personal and there will be a change of mind about your circumstances and your future. You know, I feel like we often need to dust off our attitude towards some of the, th the verses that we're so familiar with. You know that expression, familiarity breeds contempt? Um, I'm going to read you a verse and I want you to think about if you ever hear this verse and go, yeah, 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 I know about that, you know. Here's the verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. This is God talking to you. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil to give you hope in your final outcome. You know, this isn't just some bunch of words. This is not some generic thing that applies to somebody else. This is a personal treasure. And we need to polish off our attitude about some of these great promises of God. He has plans for you. He's thinking about it. He has thought about it. He's made plans. He's working on it. He's not sitting there waiting to see how things will turn out, which is somehow how sometimes we kind of feel that way. But he has plans for us, a good future. And so we need to polish up that, that verse and treat it as a treasure. It's special. It is a treasure, and it should be precious to us. If we will take hold of it in faith, take hold of all of his promises, not just the ones that I'm putting up here, declare them, pray them, and believe them, we will be changed. See, our circumstances might not be changed, but we will. 
We will be changed. We will have hope. We will have courage to believe that God is at work, that God is thinking about us and planning to do us good. Remember, he will have joy in doing us good. He will do all the good that he has promised for us. So it will shift our attitude. It will begin to release hope. It will instill courage in our hearts. You see how important it is to take the promises and really, again, believe them for ourselves. You know, I discovered something really neat. I was looking up the word hope in Hebrew, and it not only means the expectation or something that I long for, that we know, but it is translated sometimes as a chord or a line. The same word that's usually translated hope is used of the cord that Rahab hung out her window. She was hanging scarlet hope out of her window. Her hope in the promise of God was visible. It was something everybody could see and it connected her to what God said, I will protect you and your family if you're in that house. And I just thought, what an incredible word picture of what hope is. Our hope isn't supposed to be something just a little teeny thing in our hearts. Our hope should make us confident and, and bold to talk about our God and to advance into what he has for us and to cling to his promises. It's a cord, it's a rope that ties us into the nature of God, into everything that he purposes to do for us, the things and the, that he's thought about, the plans that he's made. Hope ties us to that, right? It's an, we will be boldly expectant. We will have a, an, a, a, a rope that anchors us as it says in Hebrews, into all that God has said. It ties us to the future he has planned for us. That's the important thing about hope. Let's look at Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, 17 through 19. Yeah, okay. I'm going to read it off my paper. It's hard to read up there. In the same way God, well, it might not be the same translation, uh, accordingly God also, in his desire to show more convincingly and beyond doubt to those who were to inherit the promise, I want to stop right there and say, okay, these people have a promise, and it's God's desire that they would be convinced beyond doubt of his intent to fulfill his promise. I mean, think about that. His heart isn't just to make a promise or a plan. He wants us to know that he deeply desires us to have it without, without doubt, that we would be convinced of it convincingly and beyond doubt to those who were to inherit the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose and plan. Now that's a statement of his nature, isn't it? An unchanging God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That, so God intervened with an oath. He gave a promise and then he added, I swear to you, this is true. This is a really solemn thing. Let's go on to the next. So this was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, to ever prove false, ever deceive us, we who have fled to him for refuge might have mighty indwelling strength and strong, what? Encouragement, courage, right? To grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. You know, some trans translations say there is hope uh, laid out for us, hope set before us. What does that mean? We can see it. It's a visible thing. We have a picture of what the hope is. It's not just a word. It is a, uh, uh, something that we can visualize and believe for. That's what the hope set before us is. Their hope was the promise of the land, right? The, the promise where God would give them a home. What is the hope set before us? We're going to talk about that in a minute. God's goal is for us to know that he will keep every promise. And so he gave a promise and he swore to it so we could know without doubt that he um, is going to give us a hope, he's going to encourage our hearts, and it will keep us safe and steady. That's what the anchor for the soul is. Did, we go, did I not finish that? Yeah. We have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It can't slip. It can't break down under whatever steps out on it or pressures it. A hope that reaches further and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil. Wow. I would say God is pretty serious about giving us hope and courage and that we would have no doubts about it. 
So with hope, we see beyond the what is, we see into the not yet that God has already determined for us. It's a set thing. Steady hope will keep our hearts, our thoughts, our actions aligned with what he's doing. In Holy Spirit power, we'll be able to walk into it. Not by ourselves, so hope with hope and with power, we'll be able to walk into it. We need courage because it's gonna take a while. You know, that, that phrase, I think it's Eugene Peterson, a long obedience in the same direction. It's a long walk and it's gonna involve going through difficulties. It's gonna involve having to persevere, make difficult choices. And of course it'll involve waiting, it always does, but there's an outcome to this journey in hope. There will be increase. There'll be increase in knowing who God is, increase in your faith, your hope, your courage. You know, look what pursuing the hope uh, did for Naomi. She went back, she re received the provision that she had hoped for. So, you know, when we experience receiving what we're hoping for, what does that do? It gives us joy, it gives us encouragement to trust God for more things. Well, that's what happened to her. To her. After she experienced one good thing, she started thinking, hmm, I can have hope for more than this. There's, there's more. God has more for me. And she remembered that in love, God had already, many, many years ago, written laws that not only provided for food for the poor, which is what she'd gotten, but provided for widows. And now she had vision for something else. And she said, oh, maybe, just maybe, God has more for me than just having bread. He wants more for me and Ruth. And then that vision gave her the courage to say, let's go for it. Let's go for everything God made available. Has that ever happened to you? When you suddenly see in the word, God wants me to have this. This is his desire for his people. I can have that. Or somebody shares a testimony. Really? You mean I could have that too? That's what it's supposed to be like. A hope, a wonder, an expectation. She had a sudden vision. Aha! I can go for this too. And so they did. She, you know, she took a risk, but she was trusting that God wanted them to go and ask and to act on what he had already provided for them. And, uh, and experience greater goodness. And, and, and her willingness to do that not only blessed her and blessed Ruth, but it brought the promise of the Messiah one generation closer to being fulfilled. We have no idea what we're accomplishing when we walk in hope, when we're courageous about pursuing what God has offered to us. We can discover that personal goodness and sort of go on that pathway, have the vision, have the courage to act on it, experience God meeting our need and then hoping for more and we keep getting to a higher level of hope and confidence and expectation and courage and we that's what it's supposed to be like we're supposed to be going higher aren't we having higher faith and hope and, and courage in god but you know to be absolutely certain that we're going to have what we hope for we need to want what god wants we have to want what god wants if I have my eyes on what he wants, I will have courage to take, do whatever it's going to take to be part of his plans, courage to live differently, to commit to actually changing and, and living in a greater obedience. God's plans for us does, do not include being passive and just waiting for him to come in, you know, like Superman and make everything different for us. We have to set our hope. There's an active, okay, uh, this is what I'm hoping for. This is what I'm believing for. This is what I'm trusting God for. And then we have to work with him. We have to be willing to work with him. What is he going to ask us to do? You know, as I said, it was probably hard for Naomi to go back as a, you know, with all that loss and poverty and face the shame. That, but, but she went. It was really scary for Ruth to go to the threshing floor. If you know that, you know, that was a risky move she took there. But um, we, he, they were working with God so that he could open up what he had made available. There's a partnership here. And so, he, you know, we're often sitting around waiting for God to do something. And he's waiting for us to change our attitude and be willing to work with him and be willing to see and look at and want what he wants and get into alignment with, with his heart. When we talk about hope, we usually think, you know, on sort of every day, the kind of stuff we hope for, what's on our hearts, what we wish was different in our lives, what we're waiting for, the personal hopes, which is fine, learn, you know, loom pretty large in our eyes and somehow God's hopes, God's wants kind of get 
deprioritized, if that's a word. They kind of take a, a lesser place in our thinking and, and, and a lesser priority in our actual living because the, uh, the things in our personal lives are so up close to us. But, uh, you know, through this, I just, I just want to kind of inspire us again to think about what is it that God wants and how can we have hope for that? How can we partner with Him uh, in, in achieving what's on His heart? You know, um, one of the things we know God wants to do is to fill the earth with his glory. And I thought about, is that one of my goals? Is that something I hope for? You know, basically it's like, oh yeah, one day he's going to fill, fill the earth with his glory. Yeah, I might be part of that, I, you know, but he's going to do it. You know, he wants us um, to have his glory as our highest goal. If it were, we would already be well on the way to filling the earth with his glory. He wants our hearts aligned with that. He wants us to hope for that, act for it. Do I do things today that will increase the knowledge of his glory on the earth in the lives of people around me? You know, I'm, I'm talking to myself because this was a, a message that I felt like was, he's directing at me. Here's another thing he wants and is going to do. He's going to have a special people to present to himself. And we all know this has been a deep desire of his since before creation. In fact, I think it was the uh, motivation for creation um, to have a people, a special people for himself. Am I so longing for him to have what he wants that I'm letting him do what needs to be done so that he can begin to present me to himself, that he can present this body of people to himself? It's, it's going to be a cooperative effort. We're going to do this together. We're going to get hope and vision together. And we're going to be prepared together. And we're going to come together to be pre presented to him. You know, he's go he will have. And, and we know this. This is one of the, the th th things on God's agenda that we do think about. That he, he wants mature and holy sons who share his nature and do his works by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we, we do want that. But is it our passion? Is it a priority? See, that's what it's coming down to. It's not that we don't want what God wants. It's how much do we want it? Does it matter to us, you know? Is it, is it our deep desire to be a son of God who satisfies the Father's heart? Yes. Yeah, amen. <laughs> you know, here's another thing. God says he's going to crush Satan and make Jesus' enemies his footstool. But you know what? He says he's going to crush Satan under our feet. So we have to have the hope of our feet actually being used to crush Satan, right? He says that we get to partner with him in making Jesus' enemies his footstool. In Psalm 149, it says that's our honor to get to do that. But is that how I feel about it? That this is, this is where this is going. Do I want what God wants? Do I want Jesus' enemies his footstool? Yeah, of course I do. In sort of a, you know, theoretical thing. Do I want to be part of making Jesus' enemies his footstool? Will I work for that? Will I partner with him? Do I have courage to do that? This is where he wants to take us. It's to be our honor, our privilege, our joy, to participate with him in all of the things. Those are just examples. We want them to come, but we have to care about them more. Do we want what he wants enough to change? Do we want what he wants to shift our priorities and shift our focus? To, to really be more about him than, than about us, right? It's supposed to be more about him than it is about us. God wants his plans to be our number one pursuit. Remember, seek first the kingdom. He wants us to be like Paul, who was pressing on with hope and courage to attain the prize of the high calling. We have to have a vision of that. That's, that was his hope that there was, a, there was something he could attain if he pressed on, if he left everything else behind. See, there's the hope. And, and, and God was with him to enable him to live that way. And he's with us in the same way. We can be like that. He's, he wants to give us those strong um, hearts that will have the courage to press on. If our hope is truly in, in what he is doing and him getting what he wants, not in what we think we should have or what we think he should be doing, amazing things would be unfolding in our lives. He will be able to fulfill the hopes that are in alignment with what he wants to do, right? And then we'll both have joy because we're wanting what he wants. When he does it, we're all going to be happy, right? There's satisfaction for everybody, joy in the will of God being done in the people who partnered with him and bringing it about. So it requires intention. We have to remember our reason to hope is who God is 
and the promises that he's made. We have to take time to think about them, to exult in who God is, to really allow it to infuse us with great awe and wonder and joy. This is what our God is like. Is this the most amazing and awesome thing? We have to take time to, to um, remember what we have seen and heard, what we have understood, what has he showed us in, in our own lives? What's our history? When has he been faithful to us? Stir up the memories. Recall the things you've read. Recall what your friend has told you, what you have vision for. Stir it up again that God wants to do these things. He's giving us vision for a reason and that he is gloriously worthy of putting our hope in him, of having our courage rooted in who he is. That's why he commands us to be courageous. Be of good courage because it's a choice. It's really um, what, what we choose to believe, that he's greater than everything that faces us, that his plans are better than anything we can think up. Yeah. And when we remember that, we'll be able to choose to take courage and walk his way. And when we choose it, he says he'll supply it. Look at Psalm 27, 14, and we're almost done, so don't get discouraged. <laughs> Psalm 27, 14. Okay, there's two commands right at the beginning. Wait on the Lord, and that means with hope, right? With hope. Wait on the Lord with hope. Be of good courage, okay, and he shall strengthen your heart. So you had two commands, and then you have a promise. Wait, I say on the Lord. The command is repeated again. But the reason that we can wait on him with hope and courage is that he is busy strengthening our hearts. As we do our part, he's doing his part. You choose it, he'll supply it. That's what he's saying. You choose to do what I've told you to do, I will supply the strength. I will strengthen your heart. That's pretty neat. What this verse tells us is that when we are obedient to choose hope and courage, it attracts his grace. It attracts the active love of God to be working out what he wants to work in our lives. It opens the door to the creative things he wants to do to change us, to change our circumstances, to give us new vision. So we need to ask God to raise up hope, raise the hope level in all of us so that we can begin to see everything that he's made available. We need to let hope anchor us into God's future for us and into, who, into his promises. We need to ask for that vision. I mean, that's what I'm wanting us to go home with today, asking for vision of what have you planned for me? What am I to be hoping in that, that is what you want, not what I want, what you want? And then he can shift my heart so that I want it too. Um, let's hold tightly to our confidence that God will complete what he has begun in us. He's not going to leave us halfway. He will not abandon us, remember. He won't stop, take his upholding hand away from us. So it takes courage and hope. And the primary reason we have both of them is the promise we've been looking at all morning, the promise of his presence. Remember, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We can hold on to that. I am with you always. So. We're just asking the Lord to awaken awareness of his presence because that will give us hope. That will give us courage. And we'll be able to um, simply believe that we can be the people that he's calling us to be. Why is he commanding us to have hope and courage? So we can be overcomers. He's wanting to raise up overcomers in the last day. He wants us to be people who know our God and do exploits. He wants us to be those who will shine in the kingdom of our Father. Every difficult circumstance is an opportunity to practice hope, to choose courage, right? He is at work right now to bring all of us into willing and active agreement with what he wants to do. So we purpose, Lord. We purpose to get your vision. We purpose to stir up hope. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to enable us to see and to activate hope in our lives. We, we open ourselves up to allow you to supply us with the heart strength, the encouragement that will enable us to walk out your will, to partner with you in seeing your will done on the earth as it is in heaven. Lord, our hope is in you alone. We hope in nothing else. There is no other sure and confident hope than in you alone. And so we remind ourselves of who you are. And we, we choose to refresh our memories of all the promises that you've made, but especially to cling as a, as a rope, a safety net to the promise, I am with you always to the end. Right now, Lord, we receive from you fresh hope. We receive 
encouragement of heart. Make us a part of your hope-filled, courage, courageous army of the end times. We choose to be your people doing your will on the earth today. Amen. Amen. Isn't that a great word? Hope and courage. Amen. Well, as the worship team comes back up, as we prepare our hearts for communion, a time of communion, we're reminded how God knows our hearts. He knows what we have need of to lead us to that place of hope and courage. And so as part of our response to the Lord today, as we get ready to partake of this time of communion, first of all, I'm going to encourage us as we receive the elements, that we would go ahead and hold on to those elements so that we can all partake together as the family of God. You know, for those of you who have been to Israel, I had the privilege over 30 years ago to go there one uh, my first time out of about three times and at that time it uh, we were in search of where they were to hold the last supper it's a special place if you haven't been to Israel there in Jerusalem but as we saw the place the general area of where Jesus had gathered with his disciples and was betrayed Along with that, there was a place where we could also see where he was taken after that time, after being in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was taken and imprisoned. And some of us had a chance to see that. And after that time as well, when we saw that place of imprisonment, we know then he was tried in the middle of the night with the Sanhedrin. And beyond that, And beyond that, he was taken to the place where they call the place of the skull, which was up on a cliff where Jesus was taken to be crucified. And yet part of that story, as we all know, is that he was taken then by this endearing man who had such a heart for Jesus that he would then volunteer to take his broken body and place it in a cave. And for some, they believe there's a certain place near the place of the skull where that took place, an incredibly peaceful place. But all of that sacrifice was made and given for you and I that we could partake of hope. We could partake of his nature. So let us be reminded that whatever we're struggling with today or whatever we're excited about because we've caught the vision of God, that he comes to us in a very personal way. And even today as we join together as his family. For we remember that We all remember that through a time of the breaking of bread and partaking of the cup, that the Lord made a provision that where we have been all broken people, where we've all fallen short of the glory of God, that he would make the provision for us to be whole people. And so this is one of the many benefits of our Lord Jesus that he demonstrated his love for us. He first loved us that we then would respond to him and become all that he has called us to be as his children. 
And so this morning, as we have these elements together, we're reminded by the Apostle Paul that on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he broke it, and he said, give thanks unto me, remember me, that you would have new life. Likewise, in the same manner, he took the cup. And he said that this is a covenant, a covenant made with my blood, shed for you, that you would have newness of life. So as we give thanks to the Lord this morning in so many ways, in this brief moment of silence, let the Lord speak to us about how he wants to impart his hope, his courage, and his vision. Let's look to the Lord in a moment of silence as we give thanks to him. Lord, we are grateful for the forgiveness of sin that keeps us separated from you. We are grateful, Lord, that you have poured out yourself. You have become the drink offering, that we would be a people that become new from the inside out. So we give thanks to you today that by partaking of this bread and this cup, that your hope now would be imparted in a fresh new way. You have come to clean the slate. This is your gift. And for this, we are eternally grateful. Let's partake together. began this service talking about magnifying the Lord. And with his help, his ability in us to realign our lives towards his plan, his purposes, we have that hope, that strength. And what he promised me this year and for others newness of life would come into each of us. Amen? Well, we invite you right now as we conclude this service, for those of you that do want to continue on and be part of this uh, monthly prayer time that we have set aside, Pam often says that the house of the Lord is really a house of prayer. And we take that seriously. And so if that is you and you want to remain in the service, please come up a little bit closer. But those of you that have need because of schedules or children or grandchildren, just quietly leave if you would. And then just close those back doors so we can maintain a sense of a blessing here. And as we gather together to pray unto him, we remember the things of this nation, the things of this state, the things of Hollywood, the things in our families that may need a, co a special covering today, and the church at large that needs the covering of prayer. <laughs> 